This is Firearms Friday, my favorite day of the week, but we had to throw all that away today, which makes me sad, but that's how important this is, folks. I give up everything that I look forward to because this topic is so important. Last night, the State House majority, in an unparalleled, stunning move, forced through a $9 billion operating budget in an amendment, 86-page amendment, forced it into the capital budget, and then forced to vote on the floor immediately. On it's just a stunning move. Brad Keithley is here to help us analyze the fallout of this and what's going on. Uh, Brad, thanks for coming on so on such short notice this morning. I was I was up trying to work through the numbers of this anyway, so I'm happy to come on. Um, I I just I'm I'm just aghast. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised based on the actions of the majority through this entire session, but I mean, even this was just beyond the pale for what. You know, just again, decorum, normal par- uh, parliamentary procedure, tradition. This was just it's, it's just a stunning move in, on top of the fact that they've now passed a budget that's one of the largest in state history at the time when we have a crisis. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's interesting. The um, the the politics of it are horrible. The, the procedural aspects of it are horrible. Uh, the numbers are interesting. Uh, they passed a budget, so they're 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 up from the Senate uh, by about 180 million dollars uh, on the operating budget, uh, and then they didn't fund any of the oil and gas credits statutorily were required uh, at about 75 million dollars. So by the time you're finished with it, they raised the budget by about 250 million dollars uh, over what the Senate had done. And then, as I go through the numbers, there's about a billion dollars I can't account for yet. Um, if you if you look at at a, a 4.2 billion dollar uh, operating budget, you add in 150 million dollar uh, uh, capital budget, and then you have to account for the permanent fund dividend. The draw from the CBR and the ERA ought to be about four billion dollars. Uh, the reports and the bill itself says the draw, the actual draw is about $5 billion. So I'm not, I'm not, I honestly don't know where that extra billion dollars is going to yet. There, yeah, and there's no way to, again, when you're handed an 89 page uh, uh, amendment uh, in a very technical document, I mean, the, the operating budget's a very technical document. It's going to be days to try and pick through all the pieces on this. Uh, I mean, this was something that was done absolutely in secret behind closed doors. I don't think anybody really knew what was going on except for the principals involved. And, and the fact that they expect people to just pass it blindly is is really astonishing because, like you said, even in just a few hours, you can't figure out where all the money's going. Yeah, I've been a, I've been at this for about three hours now, and it's um, I, I I haven't found the billion dollars yet. So it's uh, it, it's not something that anybody ought to be proud of. This process ought to is 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 not something that anybody ought to be proud of. It's not the way to to operate uh, government. It's not the way to try to deal with uh, with these complex uh, budget issues uh, that we're trying to deal with. Um, and I just I it, it, I don't know how uh, anybody really expected the minority to respond last night, other than other than as they did. I, I'm not sure I would have used the rhetoric that some done had did, but. If I'd been on the floor, I would have said the same thing. I, I can't, you know, I've, I I know this stuff as well as anybody and as, as well as any layperson out there. Uh, and uh, and it, as I'm saying, you know, it's taken me four hours just to get this far to try to figure it right. out. Right, so. right. Well, it's, but I think some of the rhetoric was appropriate. I mean, I think somebody, I can't remember who it was now, mentioned this is like the Nancy Pelosi bill. We've got to pass it to find out what's in it because we have no way of knowing in the five minutes that they've had that in their hands, they have no way of knowing what's in that bill. And yet you expect them to can't take an at ease. They essentially lock the doors on the chamber. One minute uh, uh, at ease is all that was allowed. Two minutes to speak on it and vote. Um, I mean, yeah. it, it, I, some of the uh, some of the uh, comparisons I think were appropriate, like the Nancy Pelosi one, because that makes no sense whatsoever. What do you? Th- I mean, what were they trying to accomplish here, Brad? Because I think we all know. That there's no way that the Senate was going to was going to jump on board with this. I mean, they just there was no way, and the damage that's done politically, like you said, it's a messy political process already. Uh, what was the what were they hoping to accomplish? 
Well, well I think I think they were trying to drive. I, 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 my sense is they were trying to drive a stake in the ground uh, against a Senate and a governor who uh, seems hell bent on pushing them toward you know using a, a PFD only uh, PFD cut only option to 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 create new revenues. Uh, I think they're trying to drive a stake in the ground that, that they're not going to go there, and that if they are pushed to go someplace, they're going to they're going to go this direction. I, this this hasn't been good on either side. This has not been a good process on either side. The House last night, especially, I think, used very bad process. The Senate's not been open uh, on uh, on on their side to considering other than the other than the PFD cut only option. Uh, they didn't even give Dunleavy a hearing. On his fiscal plan, they've never heard the 50-50 fiscal plan. Uh, they've just kept going on and on and on down this PFD only road, uh, and I just think it's a I think it's a bad process on on both sides. And in and I don't know what was going on in the in the private discussions, obviously between the two bodies, but I think the House uh, uh, came to the conclusion for whatever reason that they needed to drive a perhaps an equally uh, uh, outrageous stake into the ground on their side to, uh, to compare with what uh, they perceive to be the Senate's uh, stake in the ground. So, I, you know, we got 15 days left. I don't know if you can repair, if you can put Humpty Dumpty back together again uh, in that period of time, uh, but we've got a, it, it's a, it's a mess, on, mess on both sides. Well, one of the things that I think was interesting, one of the interesting points was actually brought up by Suzanne Downing, is that they passed this bill with no effective date, which essentially means that it's 90 days after the governor signs it. I mean, we we go dark in 14 days. Uh, that makes it even if they had gotten all their way, it still would have shut stuff down. Yeah, that's really the House minority that's doing that. They needed House minority votes to to uh, deal with the effective date, and the House minority appropriately said. You know, especially given the the corner they'd been put in, the House minority uh, uh, didn't agree to uh, to give that vote. So yeah, it. Yeah. it I mean, the, the, they try to deal with that in the bill by having some sort of retroactive funding provision uh, that I don't know. They I guess they would say they hoped that govern the governor would stay open, would keep the legislature open, knowing that he's going to get the money later on to. Uh, uh, to pay the uh, to pay the employees, but it's it, 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 it is not a good situation either way. Where do we go from here, Brad? Where do you see? I mean, what do you see happening? I mean, give me your crystal ball here. We've been watching this. You and I have been dissecting and talking about this for weeks. Uh, I mean, where where do we go from here? Well, what we talked about on Tuesday, where I thought we were going to go, was they were going to concentrate on the operating budget, avoid the shutdown. Uh, and uh, and and get and keep government open, uh, and uh, and and continue to talk about the long-term fiscal plan uh, uh, through the fall. Maybe have another session in the fall if they could come to some some agreement on it. But what the House is essentially saying, and and said again last night, uh, is is we're not we're not going to agree to an FY 2018 budget if we don't get a long-term fiscal plan to go along with it. So we're going to continue in this stare down between the House and the Senate over whether we have a long term over whether we have a long term fiscal plan. The House is going to insist on oil tax increases and on an income tax as part of that long term fiscal plan. The Senate has been uh, resisting that and I don't really see them changing. Um, so as long as we continue down this road that a long term fiscal plan's got to be part of the resolution of the FY twenty eighteen budget I think we're going to go right up to the up, right up to the cliff of shutdown, and if the House doesn't blink uh, on insisting on that, we're going to go over the edge of the cliff because um, I don't I don't think the Senate's going to give in on the on those pieces. So it, it's it's getting it's getting messier and messier and messier and more and more uncertain. I have friends who are state employees, and they're honestly, you know, one of the conversations last night was, how do I pay my rent? Uh, if 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 we go over the edge, and I'm not going to get you know I'm not going to get a a check for a job I signed up on and a job I'm perfectly willing to continue doing uh, in into July, it's going to get messy. The the, the yeah. way out of this the way out of this is is to back off the insistence both sides' insistence to have a long term fiscal plan, finalize the FY 2018 budget. They're about 250 million dollars apart. Um, finalize the FY 2018 budget, fund it uh, through a combination of CBR and ERA draw, 
uh, and 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 get get yeah, keep government open for FY 2018, and then continue to work on long-term fiscal plan. These things, these these overwhelming or or significant changes in statutory fiscal policy don't happen overnight. Uh, it took three years to get to SB 21, the oil tax reform. Went through right. different diff- different machinations. Went through different structures. Finally got to it uh, in 2013, um, and and it's and I think it's not surprising it's taking us that long to get to a long-term fiscal plan, uh, but to hold the FY 2018 budget, to hold an operating budget hostage while you're trying to do that is is where I think we're going off the rails. We uh, and again, no discussion on the 50/50 plan, no discussion no. on. On, on on the one thing that could potentially save us without having to tap into the PFD, without having to create a, uh, a, a any kind of tax, mass tax on on people. I mean, this is this is crazy. Now, yesterday, and and I guess we'll digress just a little bit because uh, yesterday had Pete Machicki on, and uh, and he basically told us during the time, well, fifty fifty will never work because it would ruin it would it would basically mean that we would lose the permanent fund. Because if we if we use that fifty fifty, the permanent fund would go away because we couldn't uh, couldn't afford to sustain it. What say you? Well, that I mean that's been the mantra they've had since the beginning. But they base that on the administration's revenue forecast, long term revenue forecast, which we already know is wrong. We know it's wrong because production levels are staying up higher than the administration forecast, even in the even in the spring update. Uh, the production levels are staying up much higher than the revenue than the administration has forecast. Oil prices, while we're in another down dip now, if you look at the long-term forecast by EIA and and IEA and others who look at these things over the long term, oil price forecasts are are to to go up. If you look at long-term revenues, we are going to be at higher long-term revenues than the administration has forecast. That gets us out of this hole. If you if you keep spending under control, that gets us out of this hole. When the Senate when the Senate talks about that, they're basing it entirely on the administration's revenue forecast, and right. that that to me is just you're starting from the wrong discussion point. You're starting well, you're from starting from a flawed premise. Is wrong. You yep, can't exactly build an right. entire philosophy on a flawed premise to begin with. If your foundation is not secure, your house is going to fall. That's what happens. And and if we yeah. already know that it's wrong, and the rev- and the administration even admitted that their numbers are not updated and proper. I mean, even with a two hundred million dollar increase showing already, they say it's not right. I mean, it's just you know, how do you even base everything off that? But again, and, it just and, seems. Go ahead. Well, and the funny thing is, the Senate Finance Committee, the Senate Senate will talk out of both sides of their mouth on this on this issue. They'll say, look. Our fiscal approach is okay because we know oil prices are going to recover. We know production levels are going to stay higher. And so our, our plan is, is fine uh, because we know those things are going to occur. And then the next breath, they say, oh, but by the way, uh, you can't do 50-50 because, because we're going to base it on the administration's revenue forecast. And, and by gosh, we're going to have a crash and burn situation. I, it, 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 I chuckle every time I hear – Somebody like Senator Machicki say, well, our fiscal plan is good enough because we know oil prices are recovering. Well, if you know oil prices are recovering and you know production levels are going to stay higher, you know that 50-50 has a chance to work. So let's have a hearing on it. Let's discuss it. Let's, let's consider it as a plan. But they refuse to do that, and, and frankly, they refuse to do that because even the Senate wants to keep government, level, government spending levels higher than the long-term sustainable level. So it, it, it's a mess down there. The, we're not going to get the long-term fiscal plan resolved in the, in the next 15 days. We need to get the operating budget done so we don't show, that shut down government, and we need to continue the discussion on the long-term fiscal plan. Best case scenario, the governor, you know, the House, the Senate adjourns today. The governor comes back later today and basically says, new special session, one single item on the agenda, an operating budget. Am I right? Yep. That that would be the best case. That would be the best yeah. case. Whether the government whether the governor will do it is is another question. He keeps wanting to have a long term fiscal plan also, but that would be the best case. Single shot special session. Focus on the operating budget. Get it done. Brad Keithley, thanks for coming in and joining us, my friend. I appreciate you uh, doing it, especially last minute like that. Uh, we'll look forward to my talking pleasure. to you with more fallout on Tuesday. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Firearms Crime Michael Duke Show. You know.